Chad, what are the Georgia Guidestones? Uh, the Georgia Guidestones, uh, the late now deceased Georgia Guidestones, were uh, these like a man-made massive stone tablets with instructions on how to, I guess, rebuild society in case the world ended. I was jokingly going to call it American Stonehenge, and then on the Wikipedia page, it is referred to as American Stonehenge. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, yeah. It was like it's it, it there's i think a really good like last week tonight clip about uh kind of diving into it of it seems like it's just kind of this interesting like americana thing and it, it seems genuinely okay where it's like live a good life drink clean water wash your pee pee or whatever like all the things that society <laughs> might need to know don't put the drinking water in the pooping water yeah 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 poop downstream that kind yeah. of thing you um want, you want 40 percent of your deck to be land draws uh, <laughs> that's right <laughs> <laughs> sliver only deck should be exiled um <laughs> things like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's there's also some strange like um bigotry in it where there was like some line in it about like it was vaguely applying like don't mix the races <laughs> was also embedded in the what georgia year was <laughs> Uh, it didn't say it that clearly, but it was like, oh, and then when you like look up who funded it, it was some old white guy who maybe had questionable. So the Georgia Guidestones were this very flawed uh, Americana landmark. Uh, and uh, sometime in the last like, couple weeks, uh, someone blew them up. <laughs> There's like video <laughs> of a car driving away like at a sedan and, oh my God, and so yeah, someone look- demolished them. Yeah. Oh, well, here's the here's the even... Uh, even better thing well it's not better this is terrible they destroyed the swahili and hindi slab so they it's not even that they were going uh, after after yeah. all of them they were just because i was looking at them and i was like well i mean these are written in the, a variety of languages and you would think anything made in america would be written in american and and nothing <laughs> yeah. else yeah. you know so like i i was actually kind of impressed for a moment there but now that i found out that uh, they had uh, cr- crazy racial theories in every single language. I do not appreciate it as much. Well, I think, yeah, I think it was unknown. I didn't know it was only those tablets that got blown up. It was one of the, like, before even people came out about, oh, the 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 bigotry in it, it was like QAnon was all about the Georgia Guidestones are evil. Like, er- it was getting it from all sides. The Georgia yeah, yeah. Guidestones were, was not loved by anyone. No, yeah, it is, yeah there is no love for the Georgia Guidestones. Because even, yeah, they have a thing about Satanists on it. So, you know, that the... You know that the cues are after it. Uh, you know, it, it's really <laughs> weird that we couldn't have a consensus on how an ideal society should be. Just you know, as people, I think it's very, uh, it's strange that there would be such controversy around proposing one direct recipe for a society. <laughs> yeah, and these United States, United States, you think we couldn't get it together? No, yeah, it's a shame. And to to clarify, I know no history, and I have never paid attention to any <laughs> current events. <laughs> There's a lot of lessons in the Guidestones, guys. <laughs> God. I think we should make some new ones, though. I think, Kevin, you're already on it with, like, you know, Goose yeah. Aside with how to do a magic deck. Like, I think there's some some new Guidestones that we could commission and put up. Yeah, 40% uh, like lands and then the other, like, 10% other mana sources if you're making a commander deck. And then uh, ban Primeval Titan. That's it. That's easy. Open a banana from the upside down, not from the stem. It'll be much easier. Put that on the Guidestones. I still can't is do, it? I still can't do that. What do you mean you can't do it? Like you refuse to do so? Cause well, no, no. I mean, like yeah, well, pretty much. Because like I'm obviously I'm physically capable of doing it, but I it's I've been trained my whole life. I'm not changing now. Why the fuck would you open it not <laughs> from the stem? It's it's like a little lever that like cracks open your banana the like s- a beer. The stem is a, the stem is a trap. The stem is a, we are all taught wrong the stem is a trap you need to pull it from the bottom part with that little where you know the little ground the gross brown part is that's where you need to open it the (laughs) stem kevin i know what you're saying it feels like a natural a natural prying point but if you rotate it and stick the stem within your fingers it actually makes it a a good base holder you know what i'm saying yeah i I guess i'm seeing it you don't get a warm banana that way no no warm banana (laughs) and you get it and it gives you great hold and then you just do it. Why would the temperature be different? It's not how you ca- Kevin's got extremely warm hands. <laughs> you don't want you don't oh. want a warm banana. Maybe it's healthier for you. You know, Maybe. I like a good cold black banana. Ooh, <laughs> that's not even the most upsetting thing you've said today, Chad. You you were talking shit about Wolverine earlier. Yeah, you were All right, I need to defend myself. I said I said before the record. You're laying out the truth. You're not defending shit. 
I, I'm saying that if you, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Like, I think I had said if Wolverine's your favorite Marvel character, your opinion's wrong. And I yes. still stand by that, but at least X-Men. If Wolverine's your favorite X-Men, you're, you're, you're basic, is what I will say. Okay, that's fair. Um, I mean, I thought you were going to have, like, a very distinctive reason about why you have bad personality traits if you like uh, Wolverine. <laughs> I, I I have a theory based on people I have met over my my you know thirty plus years on this earth my three mm-hmm. decades plus mm-hmm. of that there is a, a dynamic in the X Men and Marvel yeah. of liking Wolverine you got a there's a little bit of um I don't know like a Napoleon complex a little bit to 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 Wolverine stand there's a little bit of like if you're putting Wolverine in your top characters, you also maybe have a Punisher sticker on the back of your truck. Like that kind of energy. Does that make sense? You're saying that Wolverine is the Georgia Guidestones of X-Men. <laughs> I'm saying Wolverine's the toxic masculinity of Marvel for a lot for a lot of Marvel. Especially in the romantic triangle of Wolverine, Cyclops, and Jean. Well, I'm, I, I agree with you because I'm a good boy who likes cyclops who is also a good boy and does what he's told <laughs> yes cyclops is cyclops is the boy scout i think he's called boy scout by several people he is yep. there's a reason why he's the leader of the x-men even if he's maybe boring he's the pillar of the x-men and there's a lot of years of marvel comics where i i i swear it's like before the word cuck was a thing it's just cuckolding stories about Psych getting cuckolded by Wolverine and Jean Grey. <laughs> where like Cyclops is like, oh, I hope Jean's doing okay. Meanwhile, she's uh-huh. just like smooching Wolverine. I shouldn't kiss you, Logan, but you're just so hairy and short. I love you. What does it say about me that if like, for instance, Nightcrawler was my favorite X-Man? Oh, that means, Paul, that's the reason why you're one of my best friends. Because Nightcrawler oh. is fucking 10 out of 10 cool sick he's got that he's got that whole thing where he's religious but also he looks like a demon so he's demonized by his own faith but he still believes oh great great character he's got layers and he wants to he wants to be a fun high schooler in the in the cartoon he wants to like hang out with the kids but his um his his little disguise thing keeps not functioning oh i loved x-men evolution that was a fun version of him yeah Kurt, it was Kurt wagner Ch- chad what if um what if my favorite X-Men is Wolverine, but it's the Wolverine from the unreleased X-Men cartoon where uh, Wolverine has an Australian accent and he says, Grr, kids. Grr, kids. <laughs> I don't know if I saw that one. <laughs> Is is that that was was that a Western cartoon? I I believe so. Yes, but he has an Australian accent for some reason, and he is not fond of of younger people on his team. Sure, I guess that kind of. Tra- it's funny because he's Canadian. They're like, yeah, no, Australian. That's the same. Yeah, thing. Australian. Yeah, yeah, same goddamn thing. <laughs> Does that one? Does that one still cuck Cyclops? Uh, I w- I don't think they got there because I think this was just a pilot. Um, Damn. Or it might be a full thing. I honestly don't know. I don't really pay attention to the superheroes that much. But my best friend Brian Shepard loves uh, Wolverine and X Men and comics. So I'll fight. I'll found... fight Brian Shepard. I'll fight him. <laughs> I don't think Wolverine's his favorite X Man, but he does quite enjoy Wolverine. We'll we'll have to get him on the podcast to defend himself. Yeah, <laughs> I I also would love to just like I, it, it's something I've been fascinated over the years in that like when I picture a comic book writer, you know, I think mm. there's a default look. There's a it's like a it's a nerdy white dude because that's the majority mm-hmm. of comic book writers for the incar- <laughs> uh, if there was a median version, that's who it is. And, like, they're more Cyclops in general, right? Anyone who grew up to write comic books is more likely probably had a Cyclops life. They were a soft boy or a good boy mm-hmm. and <laughs> followed the rules. And there's something fascinating about... And then I write my story where, like, Cyclops gets cucked by Wolverine. He's, like, the bad boy. and He didn't go to school. Or well, maybe there's a little, there's, a little, there's a little self-hate in there, maybe. There's a little something to it. Yeah. Cyclops is a little jockey, though. You know what I mean? Like, true, he's kind of like the true. jock. He's a prep. He's a prep. He's a prep, yes. He's a preppy jock. And Wolverine yep. is... Wolverine, everyone might be closer... These people might be closer to a Cyclops, but they view themselves as a Wolverine. Because in the... In their uh, deep, rich inner lives, they they know what's best and are rebelling against everything that is dumb in the world. Yeah. Wolverine is Nelson Muntz um, 
and <laughs> Cyclops is Lisa Simpson. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> See, okay, I like that. I was going there to say. <laughs> uh, why am I blanking on his name? Super Nintendo Chalmers, the guy kid who calls him that. Um, why is Cyclops oh, Ralph. Is more him? Ralph, he's more Ralph. <laughs> like, I, I think... <laughs> Seeing Psych as the jock is both valid, but also, you know, yeah, he's he's more of like he he did his homework, right? Like, there's he he he's the he's the straight and a straight edge kid who probably went to Christian youth group, uh, and you know, Chad, deserves... are you just trying to make the case that you're Cyclops? Are you just trying? No, to... <laughs> some... no. If anything, I'm I don't know. If anything, I'm Beak. Just some like gross offshoot where he doesn't have any good powers he's just part of the school um <laughs> no you're um you're the one that throws wolverine i feel what's his oh name? my god i would love Big it guy. colossus i'd love to be colossus yeah yeah i can associate with colossus like kind of kind of soft-hearted but take a lot of damage yeah i'll, I'll take that yeah you're a big old yeah. you're a big old tank I, paul i could totally see you as a nightcrawl yeah like a little weirdo that disappears all the time <laughs> Yeah, that's actually that fairly accurate. Yeah, that's like a pretty that's, a, that's me. I won't be the guy that throws spikes from from X Men Evolution. He can shoot like spikes from. I his think arms. his name is just Spike. Cool. That's cool. That's that's very again. Kevin has accurately represented himself. That's perfect. Just a cool guy named Spike who throws spikes. Like he's, he's also just, a skateboarder. Yeah, you know yeah. what you know what you're getting with spikes and Kevin. Yeah, we all just crush on crush on Goth Road. We all just have uh, like secret secret boy crushes. Yeah, we should start an X Men podcast, and I don't mean I don't mean we about X Men. <laughs> I mean like we are X Men who started a podcast <laughs> together, and we just well, talk about our X Men lives. A podcast where we just role play X Men like an old AOL chat room. That sounds rad. That's, that's essentially <laughs> what I was saying. So yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I also need to add just for I can I can feel some comic nerds right. I do read more <laughs> modern X Men. And yes, they have solved this entire triangle thing where Cyclops and Wolverine and Jean Grey are just in a threesome relationship and like live together because they're all. So oh, that's nice. That's, yeah, that they fixed it. They solved the problem by them all just fucking each other. That's fu- that's the way to do it. Do Wolverine and Cyclops ever go go to go to Bone Town? It's implied. They haven't shown it. They haven't shown hardcore penetration yet. Marvel needs to step up and yeah. like have some balls and do it. But like, there's even a an issue of the new x-men world where they live and it has like a map of their rooms and it shows mm-hmm. that psych and wolverine and jeans rooms are all connected and they've like talked about each other's bodies so it's like pretty much implied that they bone okay cool cool yeah. nice good for them yeah good for them yeah show it though marvel show like 10 pages of just thrusting i need to see them squeezing each other's bodies <laughs> Hi, welcome to Goosebuds. My name's Kevin. Hi, my name's Chad. And I'm Paul. And today, we've read Invasion of the Body Squeezers. Part one. Part one by R.L. Stein, the rare uh, two-parter. I was going to say, because I don't remember in the original, so we've read the original series. Yeah. I don't yes. remember, was there a two-parter in the original series? No. Huh. Uh, no, there's like sequels, but no, no, no actual breaking it up into two parts and and i think kevin you said very wisely when we were playing this episode of you know (laughs) rl rl figured out a way to make two books out of one story so we're gonna make two episodes out of one story yep and i I know this is the only two-parter because at the top of the book of the cover it says the first uh two two two-parter in the goosebumps series okay and but from what i'm seeing it looks like it's never happened again (laughs) yeah yeah well I can kind of see why. <laughs> I was going to say, perhaps RL realized a mistake in making this. I, I'm curious. This this book, I mean, we haven't read, this is like reviewing the first episode or something of a, or halfway up through a movie. So it's hard to say where it goes. Right. Um, maybe we'll all get Lindelof and it sucks at the end. But uh, I, I don't know. Like I, this book was fucking ripping. I was really enjoying it. Me too. Yeah, I'm ready to say off the top that I liked this book because, but I know that I've said that before, and then by the end you've convinced me to hate it. So who knows? <laughs> I I thought the first half of this book was a chore, but the second mm-hmm. half like cooks. It's really really good. I agree, and I'm wondering if again to your point, Chad, about who knows what's going to happen in part two. We've only watched half the movie. I feel like 
this is an instance where like he got to write this book and he was like, I just get to go for it and I don't have to wrap anything up. Nothing has to be tied up by the end of this book. I just go. Yeah. And yeah. I, the next book, he's got to solve all the problems that he set up. So yeah, it's the, it's the me sowing versus me reaping meme. Mm, yes. It's gonna, it would, I cannot wait to reap in the next book. <laughs> Should we should we set this uh, story? I feel like we didn't hear the character's name until the very end of this book. It could have been wrong, but it just felt like he didn't say it until then. Yeah, they kind of fake us out for a really long time by not saying uh, Jack Archer's name. They don't drop the whole name Ar- Archer until the very end, but there are a couple of Jacks that his sister Billy, uh, his annoying right. sister Billy, calls him Jack a couple of times throughout. But not, I think for a couple chapters, it's it's not revealed. <laughs> Is Jack Archer the most pissed on? goosebumps kid in the entire world perhaps it's funny because everybody hates jack and they do make fun of him but there's like a love underneath all of it well jack needs to stand jack needs to stand up for himself but jack has also there's so there's like four bully kids but they're not really bullies they're his friends at the same time like there's like (laughs) it's kind of a sweet scene later in this book where the bully two of the bully kids are bullying him like kind of good naturedly and then they invite him to a Dodgers game and then he can't make it yeah. and they're like bull- and they bully him some more and then they're like sorry you can't make it to the Dodgers game and they leave him. I-, I feel like that's very accurate to how like my uh, childhood friendships went early on. <laughs> it felt real. Yeah. It felt like how we were to each other which was like you Jack you deserve some better friends and then I was like wait all kids are like this. All kids <laughs> are assholes. And then I and then you realize that, that this is just real and RL really tapped into something real here. What what is the real the actual bullying that happens to Jack in this? And I think this isn't the first Goosebumps kid to to be the unpopular or the weirdo or or what have you, right? Like I think right. Go Eat Worms kid was probably like the grossest one. But like these bullies kind of seem to want to be his friend, like you said. I, what, the most thing they call him is Saucer Man because mm-hmm. it's the recurring thing. He really he really hates it. Yeah, and a nickname that is set up in the beginning and teased in the beginning. It seems very exciting. And then when you find out the actual origin of Saucer Man, it is not as cool as you think it's going to be. But, like, it's not even that bad. Like, I was going to say, like, it's, it's, it's established that, like, oh, Jack has cried wolf a couple times and thinking he saw something weird. Like, he thought he saw a Sasquatch and he thought he saw a mm-hmm. UFO and then they realized it was just a street light through trees and he had a picture. So he gets called Saucer Man. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of how it works. You get dubbed a nickname when you're a kid for a dubious reason, and it sticks with you for your entire life. Sure, yeah. It's kind of, affe- I don't know, it feels kind of affectionate by the kids. I don't know. They're, they are also mean to him. It's, it's kind of a, it's a strange balance. It does not seem affectionate by his sister, who we're introduced to in the very beginning of the book. Uh, she seems to be truly picking on, on Saucer Man, a.k.a. Jack. Uh, but... We do learn about this while they're watching a very cool show called Fangs, which is about animals <laughs> eating each other. <laughs> and and they talk about how uh, they love to watch stuff eat other stuff. And I think that's really fucked up. It is fucked up, but it's also true of being a kid and not having access to like you can watch Animal Planet because it's like an educational show. But like you can also like watch you know a, a, a lion eat a gazelle or whatever. Get some yeah, you get sure. some killing tapes in in the middle of it. Yeah, I, I want to hear what you guys thought about like Billy, who is yeah the the younger sister uh, set up as the the default you know antagonistic. Uh, we don't get along. Billy's entire shtick throughout the this book is she just one ups whatever Jack says. Uh, if he said if he said he saw a thing, she's like, I saw two of them. Let let it be said that RL can write an annoying character. He yes. leans in fully. He got this is like dialed up, dialed up annoyance. It works. It's effective. I can't, you know, I can't blame RL. Yeah, for, for this one, I got a little sick of Billy. I mean, I guess that's kind of the point. Uh, yeah, the point. It's it's hard to be like you did this wrong when like he was setting out to write an annoying little sister character. I I like that she has uh depth because the other thing that i think works really well in this book is the giant final fantasy 7 meteor hanging over all of it <laughs> yes, oh, oh my funny. god yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. so wild. The, yeah. <laughs> what's the kirsten dunce movie where like a planet's just hanging overhead and she's like i'm sad about it uh melancholia maybe 
Melancholy. The melancholia is what I was. Yeah. Thinking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Final Fantasy is a better reference. It's pretty. You know, in 1998, there was a lot of uh, talk about Y2K and the the impending doom that that was creating, and I think a lot of us were pretty nervous about it. Right. I think mean, I know I was nervous, like being like, "Oh my God, is the is shit gonna just fall apart?" And this book taps into that like childhood angst and and anxiety that was being felt at that time i think a little mm-hmm. bit because this came out in like 1998 and kevin to your point billy is like is pretty nervous throughout this like we get like she's being annoying as hell throughout the book but there are like moments where like jack is like watching her while she's not being annoying and she's like doing like quietly contemplating the television and she's like mm-hmm. very nervous and his parents are like holding her hands and she's like like she's got she's obviously dealing with the threat of of Final Fantasy VII asteroid, Genova asteroid, very, <laughs> yeah, very yeah. heavily. Yeah, let's 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 follow up for people who haven't read the book because like, I think Kevin, you hit on what was the coolest thing I've read in a Goosebump book in a long time. Was yeah, there's there's uh, while it's already established that Jack's a bit of a paranormal head, mm-hmm. um, and he has had a fascination with aliens and stuff before. There is public news; uh, scientists are talking about it. Clearly, the president's getting briefings. About a massive asteroid that is not only heading to the planet, it seems to be stuck in orbit and is seeding other smaller, like, asteroids off of it as it flies overhead. Right. And this is a, what, multi-week event? It's not landing. It's just kind of, like, Orbiting. ominously floating there. Yeah. It's really creepy. Yeah, nobody knows what it is and everyone's, like, trying to stay, like, the adults are all trying to stay calm and, like, things are going on as usual, but, like... I, I like this idea of like the asteroid representing sort of like a generalized anxiety disorder among people in the nineties. Uh, it's <laughs> it's fun too because the uh, NASA scientists and other government officials who keep showing up on TV repeatedly are saying "Do not panic" over and over again, which is only making me, <laughs> the reader of this book, panic even more. Yeah, I, I'll give RL his biggest compliment ever. Uh, this reminded me of Junji Ito. Like it felt like <laughs> something from one of his yeah. books. Of just the existential dread is what is driving some people crazy. Yes, yeah. The only thing that can draw Jack's attention away from the existential dread is their next door neighbor, Mr. Fleshman. <laughs> <laughs> I know that name. A real name for a real human. <laughs> it's not even like Fleischman, which is a common right. name. Yeah. It's just flesh, Fleshman. Yeah. Uh, and weird shit is happening. And Mr. Fleshman has moved in pretty recently and has, uh, and Jack's enamored with him. Well, he's captivated by those silver eyes he keeps calling out. His silver his hair, tall, silver his eyes. His tall, silver hair, silver eyes. Uh, Jack's got a little bit of a boy crush on this neighbor, I think. Why wouldn't you? He sounds like, he, he honestly sounds a little bit like, uh, which am I called from Stranger Things? Papa? Uh, yeah, Papa. <laughs> I'm trying to remember his You're name. Like Papa. Uh, private private Joker from Full Metal Jacket. I can't remember his goddamn name. <laughs> oh my god, I just realized that's who that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doctor Doctor Brenner. Yeah, he looks a little bit like Doctor Brenner in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Him. He's got like a he's got like a silver fox thing going on. <laughs> See, I was picturing Ted Danson the whole time. Oh, that's even oh, better. Also, also a heart a heartthrob. Let's say it's Ted Danson for the Ten rest of this. Ten times better. Oh my god, Kevin. Thank you. I mean, you cast Ted Danson in anything, it makes it better. Yeah. And it makes and all of a sudden the get why the parents want to be friends with this guy who does not want to be friends with them. If he's not very friendly, uh, mm. he according to to Jack um, says his parents try to say hi to him all the time, and to, which to me sounds like a guy who's just trying to live his damn life and yeah. and, and, <laughs> yeah. do, and doesn't want to be bothered. Uh, <laughs> and then Jack decides to spy on him for that reason. So uh, <laughs> you may not you may think he's not friendly, Jack, but at least he doesn't fucking spy on you. <laughs> There's, a, I mean, I guess they're trying to think. He was already spying before the first creepy incident is Jack's friend bullies uh, throw a, a ball at him from his window, which he mistakenly thinks is a meteor for a second. Right. Um, He's got meteor. And then the sense. ball lands in Mr. Uh, I was going to call him Mr. Slenderman, Mr. Fleshman's <laughs> yard, and he keeps the ball, uh, but- which is, that's how the rules work. I think that, I think that Jack says that he has seen a strange creature before this even happens. I believe... Oh, you're right. I believe he I says right. he has seen... He has caught glimpse of a strange, gray, dented head creature inside of Mr. Fleshman's house, and that's why he's outside spying mm-hmm. when his uh, four frenemies show up and throw a ball at him. His, his four frenemies being Maddie Weiner, Marsha James, 
Derek Lee, and Henry Glover. You will not need to know these names ever. No, they are they are all the interchangeable same person, essentially, except for Maddie, who is, quote, pretty awesome looking. Could have been yeah. one character. Could have been one character. <laughs> one, one pretty awesome looking character would have worked. Maybe. Maybe it's all going to pay off that one has, quote, a, like, rat nose and one has a round face in the second book. Maybe that'll be a, it's a true. thing that counters the, the aliens. Uh, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of detail on how much. Was it Maddie or the other girl that is, like, an aspiring actor? She's pretty awesome looking. So, he, yeah. And then yeah. he goes into why she's pretty awesome looking. I just, uh, fun words uh, that I'm sure he was like, hey, Hey, my children, would you call someone pretty awesome looking? And his kids trolled the fuck out of him and said yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, we wouldn't say we wouldn't say they're a babe. We'd say they're pretty awesome. They're pretty looking. awesome looking. Did Did you guys catch the part where uh, Derek and Henry give each other two handed high fives? Double no. hand <laughs> high five. <laughs> you know the old two handed high fives. Later on, they give each other high and low fives. <laughs> the slap hands. Yeah, I, I missed that. But thank you for. <laughs> Hey, RL, just call it a high 10. That's what it is. <laughs> did you guys did you guys catch the what felt vaguely inappropriate in the art class? Not to jump around a little bit, but with the uh, Ma- Maddie's the, the, the model one, right? The pretty awesome uh, looking one, yeah. Pretty awesome yeah. looking one. And it is called out that they're around LA. So I guess she could have a success in the in the industry that uh, during their art class, the teacher's like, and of course we're going to do some sculpture with clay and Maddie's going to model. She doesn't have to do the assignment because she's the pretty girl. <laughs> Just do her. I read it as, I, I know what you're saying, Chad. I read it as she's comfortable sitting in front of the class. I'm going to, I'm going to give RL a pass on this one. I'm going to give a non creepy pass and say, she just felt like she's she d- does not mind to sit in front of the class and be and be stared at for hours while people mold clay. So to just get us through some plot a little bit. Yeah, uh, he, he's accosted by uh, his his horrible friends as he tries to spy on uh, F- Mr. Fleshman. Uh, he sees an altercation uh, between Fleshman and uh, a a monster with a crushed skull. Yes, the same yeah. monster that he caught a glimpse of. He he sneaks up to Mr. Fleshman's front door and peers in. And uh, the monster is walking through the house and throws Mr. Fleshman against a wall uh, mm-hmm. it, very violently. And I say that because we will come back to that extremely violent throw uh, later on. Uh, and, uh, we have, and again, we haven't gotten a full payoff for this yet. But I do think that there was a, a little strangeness there. Yeah, he, fi- he finds him fighting and then he runs back to his home to call the police because it figures that's the only thing you can do when he sees this assault happening. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, is this the moment where uh, the book was written on how phones don't work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. thinking about that. I, I was thinking about that too, because he profoundly misunderstands his uh, power in the phone situation here, Chad. You're so, right. so he, I think what happened is Jack tries to call the police but as soon as he picks up the phone, he hears a voice on the other end that says they're the monster. And it's like, too bad you saw me. Now you're going to die. I am the creature and I'm coming for you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it's the frenemies who are all prank calling him. I guess they just called it the exact second he picked up the phone. Uh, no ring. He's like, get off the phone. You have to get off the phone. I need this line. I'm like, Jack, that's not how phones work. I guess RL just needed a chapter break, I guess is the... <laughs> Is the answer for that? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's um, it's tiring, honestly. A little bit of my soul is eroded every time we have one of these little just kidding <laughs> chapter breaks. <laughs> just chipping away. There's a great one in this where it's like every but like the, the Mr. Fleshman has a cutaway, and it's just like let me say something menacing real quick, just yep. naturally in the middle of this conversation, uh, just because I feel like throwing a little menacing line in here. Yeah, Mr. Fleshman says stop spying to him. No, wait, Fleshman shows up at his house after the phone call because he, he like gets through like nine one and he doesn't press the last one or whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then Fleshman shows up at at his door being and um He has the ball he has the ball that, that his frenemies hit him in the head with, which we did end a chapter with Mr. Fleshman staring at him. Uh, yes. knowingly watching Jack spy on him, slapping a ball between his hands. Yeah, why was it called that? Why can't you describe it as slapping the ball? I, I don't know. It was cool, though. It was a cool move on Fleshman's part. He alters from being, between being really, really cool and having, like, some, like, predator vibes. Yes. 
yeah. yeah there's, there's some, like rear window energy to this every once in a while, right? Of like things that Jack sees across the the fence and making this eye contact right, with Fleshman, yeah. and then the the this creepiness of like. I hear your your mother told me you've been talking about me, Jack. I don't like you talking about me. This is your final warning. Like, yeah, it's kind of creepy. It's yeah, scary. Yep. Yeah, there's some real creepo stuff that comes through on that. And you're like, this is incredibly direct, and there are no adults around to verify what he said. So <laughs> I'm gonna say that this is gonna be a misunderstanding later, unless it isn't. <laughs> This is one of my favorite versions where the parents needed to leave the scene as opposed to the default of uh, parents have a work vacation that needs to fly away for a week. Uh, There was just one night in it where the parents went to go see a movie and they left the kids at home. And I thought that was very funny because that's not something my parents would ever do. Would they do that for yours? Well, Billy's at a friend's house, so um, Jack, Jack has no responsibilities. So the parents went to a movie by themselves? I don't know. Maybe maybe my parents were too attached to me, but there's Aww. no way that would ever happen. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's sweet. Maybe I just revealed too much of my, my life. Dad, you can leave like a 12-year-old alone for like a couple hours. <laughs> They're probably going to read a book or something. Damn, that sounds... That sounds like I wish you had told that to my parents when I was 12. <laughs> that, that sounds great. They aren't going to know how to be alone if you don't do that. <laughs> I mean, Kevin, you're really hitting to the core of what I'm still dealing with in my in my 30s. So, yeah. I feel like a 12-year-old is not truly creative enough yet to, yet to get into some severe trouble. They might cause a couple problems for you, but nothing that you can't clean up as soon as you get home. Oh, do we have any parents of 12-year-olds who listen to the podcast? Let us know <laughs> if they can be left alone. I None of us have any children. <laughs> yeah, how much trouble can a 12-year-old cause? Let me know, please. And, and Yeah. Please leave it as a the comment somewhere. I walk back my statements about the irresponsible parents of Jack and more just now I'm re-examining my own childhood. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so Mr. Fishman, Fl- Mr. Fishman, Mr. Fleshman shows up uh, with the ball and gives it back and essentially just tells Jack to stop spying on him, right? Yeah. He's like, he's like, leave me alone. Jack, uh, Jack uh, is happy to know that Mr. Fleshman, quote, won the wrestling match, which I thought was a very <laughs> fun way of describing the assault by the monster on him as a wrestling match. Uh, yeah, Fleshman acknowledges that what Jack saw happened. And he's just like, that's my private work. Don't interfere. Right. He doesn't even like go like you were seeing things. You're a crazy kid. He's right. just like shut up. Right. He's like just yeah, and and we fi- we do get a little a, a quote unquote explanation soon. In that moment, Jack decides that he needs to go and he has to spy on Mister Fleshman. He has to break into his home and he has to find out what's happening there. Um, but he can't do it the next day because he has to go to his cousin's house. Uh, who pinches cheeks? Uh, I don't. Ha- I don't know if I know anybody whose cousins would pinch their cheeks. That seems very strange. These are his weird elderly cousins. This is a totally superfluous scene. It doesn't matter at all. No. Shout out to Burbank. He's got to go to Burbank. He's got to go to Burbank. It. It's elderly cousins. What does elderly cousins mean? I mean, I have like 50 year old cousins. I can buy Is that it. what it is? Is it like they're like grandparents or like like aunt, uncle age or something? Is that what's going on? Families be different sometimes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Not all families are same. <laughs> Cousin cousin can mean a lot of different things. Can yes. we get that stitched on like a pillow, put a merch? Not all families be same. Not all yeah, families, but not all families be same. <laughs> so we okay, we could skip past the totally totally superfluous uh face pinching cousin scene. When did we get to his dad playing Game Boy? That's what I was yet? just jumping to. <laughs> We're back home. Sister is watching TV. There's more scary stuff uh, about to happen on the TV, but dad is trying to play the Game Boy with Jack. His hands are too big for the for the Game Boy, which means that his hands are like Andre the Giant sized. Because it means that Miyamoto massive. failed on the design of the Game Boy. Yes, it, yes. It, it means that he has big Yowie hands. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jack makes an allusion to uh, needing a he, needing the Virtual Boy, which I feel that Jack missed uh, or dodged a very large bullet with not getting the Virtual yeah. Boy. Uh, yeah but like can we just live in this like little game boy scene for a while because (laughs) i gotta be honest up until this point like i was not engaged as a reader and literally (laughs) that's what this that is what it's here for kevin that is what it It pulls you in it is here for 10 year old kevin to read about game boy and see the word mario and go i like those things if only rl had like overly described it was like it was one of the see-through clear plastic game boys you can see all (laughs) my good he had a game boy light on top of it oh my goodness if he had uh, if rl had done that that would have been true mastery of this form I'm embarrassed because as like a 33 year old man, I was like not engaged with this children book, children's book until the Game Boy showed up. And then I was like, 
oh my god yeah game boy mario these are things i recognize <laughs> playing super mario land that one's great <laughs> i don't know it's not like it's it's not quite a um uh product placement because he's not getting any money from nintendo for this right right so like it's just i don't know it was it was just there because he wanted to connect with like a 10 year old or or me <laughs> he's buying cred he just it's a it's a cred buy that's all it yes. is and it works honestly i want rl to, to watch us become the way that like Brian Jacques in Redwall will describe a, uh, a feast, feast of nuts and berries and cordials mm-hmm. and cord. I want I want RL or another writer to be the guy that just spends chapters describing the gaming hangout sessions that these characters partake, and then they use the lock in technology of Sonic and Knuckles plus Sonic Three. Chad, I'm sorry to tell you, it's Ernest Klein that is that person. Oh no. <laughs> I fell into a climb hole. I hate to tell you, you've been climbed. You self-climbed. Oh, no. I need to go retire as a writer. Oh, no. (laughs) I want a scene where the dad's playing Game Boy and he's like, how the fuck am I supposed to beat Brock with a fucking Charmander? (laughs) (laughs) Jack, you picked the wrong starter, you idiot. (laughs) We need to to write our own... Goosebumps, just so we can write those scenes into it to have the game, yeah. the Game Boy subplot going. And his son will say, "Hey, you gotta go back to you know Viridian Forest, catch catch a Caterpie, train it up uh, until it's a Butterfree, and it'll learn confusion, and that'll be that'll exploit the Geo dude's um, low special defenses." <laughs> oh, that's smart, Kevin. Dad. You gotta catch them all, you idiot. <laughs> Dad, I'm playing it on hard mode. Charmander is hard mode. Be proud of me. Uh, he won't. He won't. <laughs> and after we've lived in the Game Boy scene for a couple of moments and really enjoyed it, then another news flash appears on the screen saying that they still don't know what the asteroid is, but that it's nearing impact with the Earth, I believe. I believe they say that, right? Yeah, there's a nice detail in the scene where Billy is scared and, like, her parents, like, comfort her on the couch a little bit while Jack is off being Mulder in the corner. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> nice. It is very nice to have, like, a moment where, like, the annoying character is just, like, kind of humanized for a bit. Like, it's very real yeah. to, like, your family where you're, like, your siblings do annoy you a lot when you're young, but then you're, like, if they're, like, really upset and concerned about something your your uh, familial instinct comes out instantly right yeah there's a moment where jack uh kind of cell phones himself where the family is like huddled around the tv or the dinner table and jack is just dunking on billy saying you know like oh she's so annoying and like they're like jack billy just repeats everything you say and what else you because she looks <laughs> up to you and then jack goes like well she's stupid and i want to be like jack do you think that it's stupid to like you is that how much <laughs> self-hate you have I I heard I heard something um about about raising children earlier that kind of seems to apply to this where like the old knowledge of like raising kids is that the second you get a younger sibling you're expected to become an adult. Uh-huh. Hmm. <laughs> like you have to set an example, you have all this responsibility, you have to do all this stuff and it's really unfair to like the kid that they don't get to be a kid anymore once they have a younger sibling. Mhm. Mhm. I I think a lot of Jack's outbursts at Billy are, you know, relatable and and you know, she is annoying and he is going a little too far, but Jack is a child. <laughs> like yes. He's not like old enough to know how to like process being responsible for someone more vulnerable in his family. Right. I, I have some sympathy for Jack not being the greatest, like, older brother yet. Totally. And he's dealing with the anxiety of a freaking asteroid flying at Earth right towards that. Yeah. I love how underplayed the anxiety is in this. And, like, anxiety is a big part of a lot of R.L. Stein's work, but, like, having the asteroid hanging over, like, the Sword of Damocles for everything mm. is great. <laughs> Totally. The, even even the moment where I think it's implied that him and him and Mister uh, uh, Skin Man, uh, mm-hmm. F- Fleshman, Fleshman, thank you, Skin Human, yes, are both just like looking for the asteroid in the sky. It kind of just sets this like, yeah, this is probably a thing where like everyone across the country or planet is just sky sky sea, a little sky horny right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to get a sight. Yeah, it, it's almost magical realism, is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like. And a lot of RL stories sort of play with magical realism 
before going straight up fantasy, but like this sort of midpoint of the book is very magical realism where like the anxiety is real and it's represented by this big hanging object in the sky. Right, right. So like in this moment, uh, while the, while his sister is very weird on the couch and his parents are watching it and he's, like you said, uh, moldering up in the corner. Yeah. He goes outside and he sees Mr. Fleshman hanging outside looking at the sky and it's his first time to really have like a normal human interaction with Mr. Fleshman because there's no like he's not spying on him essentially at this moment yeah. he's just he's just interacting <laughs> with him uh and we have a, a fake out a beautiful fake out where he turns and he has fake eyes on uh which gives us our <laughs> chapter break uh he has fake eyes that bulge out and then he <laughs> proves that he was just fucking with him but we we will learn that these are all part of his his uh his personality traits for the character he is and but he does threaten him here and here's where he has the very direct and pointed conversation also the origin of a boomer's overuse of ellipses i believe right here because <laughs> he uses, he puts an ellipses between every single word of this of this overt threat uh it's pretty ridiculous um he threatens him to not tell us he says like shit like you're telling, talking to your mom a lot about me, huh? And, and shit like that. And Mr. Fleshman threatens him and tells him to, to, to leave him alone, which only strengthens Jack's resolve to spy on, on Mr. Fleshman. Mm -hmm. And he decides mm -hmm. that he is going to, as soon as possible, break into his home, which he finds an opportunity, I believe, the next day or, the day, or the, pretty soon in the future when he sees that Mr. Fleshman's car, which is usually halfway outside of its, out of the uh, garage, is not there. The newspaper is sitting on the front doorstep. Um, and he he would nor normally get that right away in the morning. He realizes that Mr. Fleshman must be out, and he breaks in through a kitchen window uh, into his home. And he smells a peppery smell everywhere, which I don't know what that's all about. Maybe he's no. making some paprikash or something. <laughs> uh, that'd be a paprika smell, I think. What's, what is what is pepper? There's like a black pepper uh, braised uh, pork recipe that's really good. I was actually thinking of paposo, which is a Tuscan black pepper beef. Okay, bye. Hmm, I don't know, but I oh yeah. now I'm hungry. But I want it. So so Jack's being eaten. Yeah, he bees bees and knees into his house. Uh, Maybe he's making cacio e pepe. That's it. There you go, <laughs> cacio e pepe. <laughs> I believe in that recipe, Ke Kevin. You would hit the pepper at the very end for the freshest pepper taste possible so i don't know that there would be a, a residual pepper smell unless maybe he just went really crazy with it the night before i mean do you use pepper or other seasonings in the line of work that we find out that mr flushman does is that is that mm. what he was implying i mean if you're doing lighting a small little light could be called a pepper Ooh, that's oh, very that's cute mm -hmm. <laughs> get a little pepper on there get a little pepper on the back of that head right there <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun thing to say. <laughs> uh, we we find out that uh, he 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 does like movie monster stuff, but we see a lot of like uh, movie posters with great titles. Yes, yes. Klong the Vampire Master or something. Yeah, along what those a vampire lines. name, Klong. We have Eyes of the Monster, Fangs mm -hmm. of the Phantom, The Mummy's Grasp, Klong the Vampire King. And my favorite, Revenge of the Leech Woman. That one is pretty, so cool. That is that's so evocative. I want. I, why is that not a Goosebumps book? Make that the book. Like you know, that's like uh, a Japanese horror style. Yes, movie. yes. Sure. That sure. Yeah. RL has been cooking up in the back of his head and has not unleashed upon the world yet, but he will. So after he like yeah, Jack kind of stumbles through several, I guess almost like sets. There's like a mad scientist lab he goes through. Mm -hmm. And then there's a uh, it encounters like a ghost. It's a cool it's a cool sequence. He he first he decides and convinces himself that it's okay to steal, and he picks up a photo a photo book <laughs> of Mr. Yeah, Fleshman's, yeah. and he says it's okay if I steal this because I have given myself the permission to. Uh, and then he is uh, uh, he <laughs> finds a black coffin, and it opens, and the monster that he's been seeing inside of Mr. Fleshman's house comes after him and emerges from it. He runs into as you said a mad scientist laboratory with bubbling flasks and beakers everywhere. Uh, he knocks a bunch over in his fright because a ghost emerges. And then we have a cool ghost sequence. <laughs> and then, and then he gets chased back out by the ghost into the hallway where the monster is about to bear down upon him. He picks up a small metal object, which he's going to bash the monster in the head with when Mr. Fleshman emerges and, and says, ha ha, gotcha kid. I lured you in here with my magical uh, visual effects because I knew that would get you in here, which is creepy. Yeah. Um, 
I keep going back and forth uh, over like whether like Mr. Fleshman's a guy, a creative guy with a cool job who's very socially awkward, or he's a child predator. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of like don't don't tell your parents about what you and I are talking about, um, which is never a good sign. Right. When you're cra- yeah. yeah, they, a lot of secrets between him and, and the child, which is not good. Uh, <laughs> also a lot of like after the cat's out of the bag to go off that same thing, Kevin, there's, he's like, Oh yeah. You know, I, I, I work on all of these effects for Hollywood. I guess that's why we're establishing this in California, mm-hmm. but I, I'm so secretive about it because I don't want anyone to learn my trade secrets. And mm-hmm. that monster you saw me fighting is a remote controlled monster that I, I set up as a fun little goof to scare you. Uh, mm. But if you ever want to come back over later and I can test out some stuff on you, that sounds great. I, I don't think he should. I think that's inappropriate. Right, right. I'm with you. By the way, what do we think of the the California setting? And, and this is sort of pointed at Chad, especially. Oh, as a Californian. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was weirdly detailed, un- uh, unnecessary, all this stuff. Like, we're going to go to Burbank. I'm like, no one makes a travel to Burbank. Um, <laughs> as someone who lives in Burbank. <laughs> it just, But it, it, it kind of helps set up the entire, oh, he's a monster movie guy. Right. right? Like, it's, fine, sure. There's a paragraph where he talks about his parents being so busy because they rented a place in Malibu and they haven't, they've only gone like one time. And I thought that was very strange where I was like, I guess we're trying to establish that his parents are really busy but like that doesn't factor into the story at all that much so i don't know what the point of that was but they throw it in there anyway there's a minivan with a surfboard on it uh, yeah for for one reason or another and a scene flavor but i like the repeated reference to lemon trees in the backyard that's just nice scene setting i i never really thought of a downside to living in my temperate zone until now like if i was able to go into my backyard and pick a lemon and make a cocktail with it like yeah. that would be i mean not to brag kevin i do have a tangelo tree in my back you have a tangelo tree yeah has it has it borne fruit yet oh it's it's born too much fruit i have too <laughs> i have too too many uh i'm an embarrassment of riches during the summer i was like if I went to go see someone, I was just giving them a fruit and tangelo, like, please take these. There's too many. <laughs> and now, and now, this is me really humble bragging. Now, for the last couple of months, just like their expired rotten tangelos are just dropping all the time. And I can't get rid. There's too many. They're just dropping rotten fruit bombs on my on my yard. It's become a curse upon you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not all, it's not all cinnamon, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all citrus and spice, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess people all over the world got problems. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I got too many tangelos. Damn. Not tangelos. Uh, the Californianess of it all, I don't think it does too much other than sets, I guess, helps sell this big reveal that uh, Mr. Fleshman is actually yeah, a, a secret. Uh, a Tom uh, Savini type. Tom Savini. That thing, that's who I was trying to think of a reference for. Mm-hmm. Tom Savini. He just makes random shit and he, and he lives in a Guillermo del Toro bleak house full mm-hmm. of all of his... Yep. His inventions. Uh, so it kind of explains everything that Jack has seen. But during his his encounter, before Jack realized it was all fake, Jack picked up a small metal box mm-hmm. to throw at said robotically uh, controlled monster. And he accidentally takes it home. I, yeah, he does accidentally take it home. I just want to loop back real quick to the wrestling match I mentioned earlier that, that Jack yeah. witnessed. That just implies that Mr. Fleshman had this robot throw yeah. his body violently <laughs> al- against a wall. I just need to call that out. Yeah. He's doing some weird shit at home he's with his getting, robots. He's getting a little freaky with his toys at home. <laughs> I, I wonder if these are the same, uh, what was it, computer computerized puppets from uh, Horror, Horror Land yes, 2? Yes, yes. <laughs> you see the origin of the computerized puppets? Oh my puppet? god, maybe he is. <laughs> then, uh... Then Jack Archer, which is still like the most fucking badass name for a 12 year old. Tom Clancy's Jack Archer. Yeah. He goes and he has uh, a cathartic KFC dinner with his family. (laughs) They got the extra crispy, his favorite. (laughs) Where he's like, well, that's the end of that chapter. Mr. Fleshman's just a cool guy and it was all a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And they all laugh and eat like the weird gravy and Jack goes to bed and then the coolest part of this book starts kicking off. Then the book yeah. kicks. The book be- now is kicking into into full drive at this point. It's about halfway point through the book was this happen? This could have just been that could have been the end of a Goosebumps book. Right. Yeah. Oh, it turns out my neighbor was just a special effects guy. Ha ha ha. Twist ending. Yeah. Uh, 
But Kevin, please please explain more of the the bat shit stuff that happens. All right. So you remember that little shiny black object that uh, Jack picked up to defend himself against Cutie, the large robotic crushed skull monster. Mm-hmm. Well, turns out some some voices start emanating like like high pitched chipmunk radio style voices start emanating from that object. And in uh, his sleep, he absorbs Jack absorbs all this strange information. And when he wakes up and his mom uh, tells him to get ready for school, the words, I will obey, leave his mouth. He becomes submissive. He becomes submissive. And the best part is this character doesn't like, he doesn't explain why it's happening. It's almost as if there's another part of the character within him that he doesn't mm-hmm. even understand. Right? Like there's, al- he's almost like got like a split character within him. And everything in this book happens from Jack's point of view. It's all written in Jack's first person narrative. Right. So it's really interesting to see him fighting himself as like the obey submissive chemicals are taking over his mm-hmm, brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's fight clubbing a little bit. Right. Yeah. He's like he's aware that he is losing or he's not even fight clubbing, he's aware that he's losing control of himself and then like regaining and this gets worse and worse as the rest of this book continues. Which is creepy. That's a scary idea. Yeah, he deals with it in front of his his sister and he's he knows this thing is making noises. He hears the voices come emanating from this box. And he's like, I have to return it to Mr. Fleshman. But he can't. Mm. He tries to go to the house. I thought this part was cool. He walks up to the house and it keeps compelling him to walk away to the point where he eventually cannot even control himself. He just re- he just runs away and goes to school. That moment is something that RL does not do a lot, which is like get a step ahead of us because – We'd be like, well, just give the thing back. Right. And he tries to, but he can't for narrative reasons. And right. I'm like, RL, just do this all the time, please. And this is why this book is good, because there's a, there's always a very clear thing that Jack wants, and there's always something in his way. And, a, and mm-hmm. a, a usually something very good, like a very good obstacle, like an, an obstacle that, like you said, Kevin, we can't see one step ahead and get a, get around. It's usually we're dealing with a dumb kid who's like, can not figure out how to solve this problem? And we're like, yeah, it's super obvious, easy solution. Like, it's great. We see him fail multiple times with this problem. Yeah, Jack's problem isn't so much that he's incompetent. It's that everyone hates his ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, there's there's something interesting in that same thing. Like, he takes the metal box to his parents. Like, listen to this. There's voices in it. Uh, and they genuinely can't hear anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I'd be curious if they explain that why in, in the next book, maybe it's like a youth thing, uh, where it's like when you're older, you can't hear certain, you know, frequencies. Maybe mm-hmm. RL was on, on top of that. Billy says that she can hear it, but it's not clear if she's one upping or not. I'd be curious if that pays off later as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of a interesting thing that he, he genuinely is alone on this right now. There's also like that scene where he makes that like, he makes this perfectly round clay sphere in art class yeah. without realizing it. And um, it's like that. What's the scene with the mashed potato like mountain? Uh, <laughs> well, my first reference is UHF where they parody it, but I'm pretty sure it's from uh, Close Encounters. Where That's he, uh-huh, yes. he makes, yeah, he makes the mountain out of the mashed potatoes. Yes. This means something. This is important. Yeah. And then he whips the ball at the window, which is like kind of a weird, violent scene. Yeah, and he he's like, ta- and he says things like, "I will obey," and he th- and he throws it. And like, what I love is the kids are making fun of him before this, right? Like snickering yeah. at him and like making like snide remarks. But when he throws the ball and screams that, he he talks about how the room is hushed, and the kids are like worried about him at this point yeah. you know like and yeah. the the joking does build back up we learn later that the whole school is making fun of him by the end of the day after the kids have kind of gotten over the shock of that outburst but that moment mm-hmm. really shows you how fucked up jack is at, is acting in this moment yeah mm-hmm. and and when he finally get takes the beeper back to mr fleshman he's like yeah it's just a beeper it's just a normal regular beeper right because you want to come over and see this robotic two-headed shark i made and he's like <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> no thank you but then but then i don't know if this happens immediately afterwards but it's next to my notes then a piece of the meteor that's been hanging in the sky flakes off and uh, crashes down. And then he's almost <laughs> murdered by a giant flaming ball from heaven. In his mind, he is murdered. He says, I am dying. I am dying. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I died screaming. And I died screaming. 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 Yes. God, that's so good. Like, that's great. 
Like, what a chapter break. Yeah, the third third impact happens. Uh, th- yes. <laughs> <laughs> he is merged with all of humanity, and then Jack loses himself. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Jack. So this this meteor crashes next to him. He comes out of his uh, I'm dying panic attack and he sees the meteor and he walks up to it and he says it smells like sour fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which at 12 years old, I would not have known what that smells like. Maybe some maybe this child does. Maybe he's got a more adventurous palate than I do at that age yeah and then he he does the scientific thing and he pokes it with a stick to see if it's hot or not which is he smart. actually does a smart yeah. thing he his he takes multiple steps before burning his hands trying to pick up this thing that just fell from space but it is indeed quite cool quite cool <laughs> <laughs> very it's very cool i i thought it was interesting how much he describes it it is a asteroid with even craters in it yeah. Um, I, I would argue that theoretically because it landed in Mr. Fleshman's yard, it's probably Mr. Fleshman's property, not mm-hmm. his. But he's okay with stealing from Mr. Fleshman. He's already convinced himself that it's okay. He, t- he takes it. And then I'd say the most frustrating part of the book for me was just this entire sequence of he wants to show it to people and they'll either not look at it or they just go, oh, well, that's a ball. The, the story is doing a good job. Uh, letting him have desires and then giving him reasonable obstacles. This is a fallback on the annoying shit that we get in Goosebumps books. You're like you said, Chad, where parents just don't listen. Look at an object that couldn't possibly be a ball. It's a fucking meteorite, <laughs> and insist that it's a ball. If they were like, it's a stone. You're just a liar. Yes. You like, you know, you're Fine. You, you're you cried wolf too many times. You think you just found this in a yard? Sure, but there are multiple scenes of adults just like dismissively. Going nah, not even gonna not even gonna look at it. Right. Immediately after he picks it up, Billy pranks him by saying, "Put me down <laughs> behind him." <laughs> yeah, like that's another chapter break. Is Billy just pranking his ass? And like mm-hmm. he doesn't get a second. He doesn't get one second of like wonder or amazement before someone like slaps him back down to uh-huh. earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this book should have been called "Jack Must Suffer," part one. <laughs> So this is where the list comes into play, right? We thought it was we were maybe mistaken thinking it was the uh, the beeper slash messenger device that he makes a list of like who can I take this to? Well, so first he tries to show it to his parents, and yeah. Billy keeps making fun of him, and his parents at this point because he's also revealed to his parents that he's been hearing voices that tell him things, right? Uh, so his parents are a little worried about his mental state. And they, they react well. They're like, we're going to take you to the doctor tomorrow. You're okay. We're going to take care of you. Which is nice that his parents are yeah. showing some love here. There's a detail in this scene that I found very funny, which is uh, dad tells Billy to go to another room. <laughs> not, not her room. Just go to a room that is not this one. Please. <laughs> Leave this space, Billy, and Billy is a good enough daughter to just go. And she yeah. just walks and walks away. Yeah. B- Billy understands the tone and is like, I see my japes and jokes are not needed here, <laughs> and I shall remove myself. <laughs> then Jack tries to call into a radio show. Oh my god. And the and the radio Oh I my love god. A, a completely unnecessary sequence where he tries to call into a radio show and they just tell him, call back in ten years. Yep. Yeah, and that's what prompts him to make a list of people that he can trust. And all of these people are authority figures. None of them are friends. Mm-hmm. No, he's a, he's got a very small social circle and also just circle around him. It is his parents, yep, uh, which has already been written off. His science teacher that we had not really dealt with at all in the story up until this point. I didn't even write his name down. Fuck him. Yeah, I, I, I name is Mr. Ifrit or something. Um, Mr. Liss, I believe, is his name. And here's the thing. There's mentions of other teachers earlier in the book, and it's like, just make that one be this teacher so that you mention him earlier and like make it be like, oh, I got put in Mr. Liss's class. He's super nice, and I like him. <laughs> so that you it's know a- RL doesn't go back and edit these. Right, you, right. You know right. he doesn't. Just have one teacher. Just have one friend. Like, kind of, like, make this easy for us. Like, <laughs> Right, right. Don't even have to do a lot of dancing around here. But then he does that, and the last person is Mr. Fleshman, who has been a little nicer to him since the reveal of the uh, of the special effects job, right? Can, can we talk about Mr. Mr. Science Teacher for a second, though? Just, I just the scene that we have with him where... Oh, yeah. Well, I think he tries to show it to his parents one more time, they, and they ignore him. So he's like, all right, we're going to Mr. Liss. And he goes into school, tries to show up early and get into class early. Uh, Mr. Ugh. Liss is not there when he shows up. 
So he puts the he hides the uh, the rock away in the back of the room. So frustrating. Yeah. Put it in your fucking locker, Jack. Like he just put it out in the, a public space. Come on. He might not have one if he's twelve. Uh, mm, I don't, fair. Uh, we didn't get lockers till high school. I don't think. I had one in middle mm. school, but yeah, I, I had middle school. But listen, who knows? California school system. Maybe they're underfunded. Maybe they can't <laughs> afford them with all of their uh, hot water they have to use on on their lawns. I, I mean, it's a hell state that's falling apart, Chad. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it very frustrating because as soon as he put it on that shelf, I was like, well, that's there, there goes that asteroid. Like, that's, you're not going to see that again. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good luck hiding anything in a classroom because, like, someone's going to take it from you. Like, that's yeah. a very that's a very good lesson for the kids. Yes. If you have anything cool, hide it in somewhere that you have the lock to. Right. <laughs> so he class finally starts or is about to start and he realizes the kids have all taken the orb and are playing keep away with it when they realize Jack wants it. Right. Um, and they end up throwing, the kids throw the ball out the window, uh, out to the yard, five stories. Five stories Jack's to like, the ground. Jack's like, you idiots, you fools. That was <laughs> That's a priceless artifact. And he, he and wonders, <laughs> hey, maybe it has smashed into dust. Jack, it fell from space. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> It took chip damage. Now it's now it's maybe it's vulnerable. It took chip damage. He, he I just liked the scene. It made me laugh so much. He runs out into the front yard of the school, picks up. Oh my god, the orbs. Well, okay. you, hold on. You skipped over the fact that he yeah. stands in the window of the five story building and thinks to himself that he the voices tell him to jump and he's about to right. jump, which he doesn't You're do. Right. Thankfully, it's a terrifying scene. But then he does run outside after he's come. He's he's beaten back the voices and he finds picks up the ball and go ahead sorry also holy shit five stories on a school like in california an earthquake territory that's mm, i don't know yeah. about that no we mm. spread those out and we have those cool exterior uh courtyards that you see in all the movies oh yeah everyone's got an open school and you get to hang out in the quad uh oh, california's great just thinking about how confusing it was to have a two-story high school I would get lost so easy in a five-story high school. Oh, yeah. Like, I would yeah. be on the wrong floor constantly. Oh, yeah. That's too many stairways. And those kids are going to be smoking weed in those stairways. You oh, can't you know it. That's them. where the good stuff happens is in the stairways, baby. Yeah, <laughs> that's too many vulnerable spots. Mm-hmm. Stories I could tell. Stories I could tell. Uh, the, story, the stories <laughs> these stairs could tell, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so so Jack's down there in the yard screaming, you idiots, and he looks back up at his fifth story classroom and sees that all of the kids are leaning out the window, yelling saucerman, they're chanting. He is he has absolutely made a fool of himself. But also now the teacher has finally shown up and has just described that <laughs> he is looking out the window at Jack and just shaking his head. Shaking his head, uh, just completely <laughs> disappointed in him. Incredible moment. <laughs> it's just like it feels like the failure of that teacher to be there on time to help a kid who was being bullied. But instead, he's just like this fucking idiot. This kid trusted him, and then he just and then he, he his <laughs> his second on his list of trusted people is shaking his head at him from above. <laughs> what what a fall! What a fall from, <laughs> what from <that>? grace! What <laughs> a fall! <laughs> Holy shit! Incredible. So Jack's gotta go fast, and he is compelled to run away, partially out of probably shame. Maybe the voices in his head. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got to get out of school. And he just leaves school in the middle of the day. Yeah. Hell yeah. I wish I had. Trouble's fake idea, kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of wrinkling my brain there, Kevin. I like, <laughs> I like that. Uh, what what happens? Does he go back to, to Flushman's house, right? Uh, now, I might be wrong, uh, but I don't remember anything happening other than he goes back. And I believe he goes into his room, right? I recall him going back to Fleshman's house, but before he's like able to knock on the door, he hears Fleshman having a conversation. Yeah, Fleshman's a narc. He's either working for like our military or the sp- the evil space like military, and he's uh, he yeah, he's bad. He's he confirms that he confirms the beeper was not in fact a beeper. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that the kid got it, but I convinced him it was otherwise. Uh, yes, I know that they are coming, and I am prepared to stop them. He is part, he, whatever the voices that are compelling Jack, Fleshman seems to be on the other side 
of that conflict. Yes. And he is talking to, I took that as our government, Kevin, but you're right. It's not clear who he's talking it, to. It is implied. Jack does also believe that is it is our government, Chad. But if we find out that Fleshman's like talking to another alien uh, government, I will, it, there's, there's possibility. Of it it. Pro- it probably is because his name is fucking Fleshman. And that is definitely <laughs> a name that an alien would use as cover. <laughs> Uh, sure, this is some Andalites and Yurks on yes. Earth kind of thing, I'm I'm thinking. I think that's what we're dealing with as well. Uh, I yeah. have a feeling the voices are... People are trying to help repel the invasion of these things, is what I'm assuming is that voice he's talking to. Oh, the Fleshman's talking to, yeah. The, because the, talking the voice to, yes. that Jacks are hearing is like very co- conquering, right? It's yes. like, we will put down roots, you will help us. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. It's all but saying, like, kill your parents. Right, uh, right. Kill I mean, your parents. <laughs> Push them down the stairs. Do it. Um, Your father has large hands. <laughs> we will put them to use in the mines. <laughs> Children who kill their parents get virtual boys. We will give you a new orb. <laughs> we have we have virtual boy three in space. <laughs> I, this this scene confused me. I think I forgot what happened because it's very strange. He runs home, puts his yep. meteor away, then goes to Mister Fleshman. And sees this sequence happen, and re- and that's when. So it's almost like just giving him a reason to go back to his room and be alone with the thing. So he puts yeah. the thing down, goes and hears the Fleshman conversation, goes, "Okay, I need to show him this meteorite so that he can help me." Runs back to his room, and then we get a very cool sequence. Oh yeah, we get we get a milky praying mantis monster emerging from the egg and and or the orb. And then, like, growing, like, exponentially large yeah. in front of him. Yeah, don't don't question where all the mass is coming from. No, 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 it no. Is, it is going from the size of a mantis to a full-grown humanoid in a matter of minutes. Yes. It's cool. It, like, I like this part. Usually, I get annoyed when, uh, in a Goosebumps book, they, like, really stretch something out for a couple of pages. But I think that this is done really well. The this is a payoff, yeah. Yeah, it's a great payoff for the end of this book the descriptions of the different things that are occurring on this creature's body and how it's growing its different parts are really cool i think this is a really dumb a really well done sequence and uh leaves me excited for for book two it ends on the cliffhanger of the alien is going towards me presumably to squeeze his body we haven't seen one person get squeezed in part one yet. That is very upsetting, Chad. I'm with you on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was no body squeezing in this. Not a squeeze. Not one squeeze. Not even like a pre-squeeze. You know what I mean? Like no, like we didn't have any like squeeze teases. Yeah, like a little <laughs> firm grasp. You know, I guess I guess Mr. Fleshman got his throat squeezed by his sex robot. I guess that could be considered a <laughs> squeeze. <laughs> you you know you know he's got a robot pro- program to give him a squeezer. Yeah. <laughs> A computerized puppet. I'm sorry. His his nightly squeezer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's the cliffhanger for this first first two part episode, uh, which we will cover book two on the next episode. Honestly, this book was spitting hot fire in the last half. It was. Yeah. Uh, and again, I hope that 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 momentum carries through book two. But I'm very worried that. The, the lack of needing to close any loops at the end of this thing was just giving it, uh, giving RL the free the freedom to just go nuts, you know? And now and then we're, we're going to have to rein it back in in part two is what I'm worried about. As you guys have called out, the fact that there's never been another two-parter <laughs> is, is, is worrisome, but I can't wait to see where it goes. I mean, I think that's for uh, economic, not, um, not story-based reasons, because, like, this could be a very, like good coherent story but when you think about like a kid looking at a library shelf where there's like no copies of body squeezers part one and only copies of body Mm. squeezers part two (laughs) he's not going to pick up part two he's he's just not going to do it right right it's not like that it's not like today where we can go on uh, the amazon and just go and pick out you know whatever part we couldn't find in the store you know what i mean yeah i i think it was probably not continued because it was so difficult for kids to collect them all. Yes. Sure. You know, if, if you were to tell me that we we're going to read a standalone sci-fi book next time called Agent Flushman, Alien Assassin, who <laughs> uses complicated, uh, like, Mysterio weapons, uh, special effects and smoke machines and everything to fight the aliens, uh-huh. I would read the fuck out of that book. I agreed. Would you read Jack Must Suffer too? <laughs> yeah, I would. 
<laughs> I'd probably check it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you want to support this wonderful show, uh, you can do it in several ways. You can go on your favorite podcast service like iTunes and leave us a review, which helps us get discovered by other folks. Uh, I have a review I just picked out right now off of iTunes from Nick PTS. Yes. who gave us a five-star review that says, Good think. My girlfriend <laughs> falls asleep to this show a lot. Please continue making so she can sleep. Will do, Nick. <laughs> You're welcome, Nick, and I'm glad we could give you good think. Good thing. Uh, you can also support the show financially and get access to bonus Camp Goosebud episodes and our exclusive Discord by going to patreon.com slash goosebuds. We also have a Goosebud store with uh, merchandise emblazoned with our likenesses and logos. Pretty cool stuff for the summer and fall. Uh, you can go to goosebuds.store or search for us on Etsy to find that. We also have a YouTube channel that's almost caught up with current goosebuds episodes where will you yeah. be where will you be when it catches <laughs> up to the current episode <laughs> i think we just dropped our zeke the plumber episode on youtube and it's yeah. always fascinating because every time we upload a video episode there's someone going i didn't know this podcast was still going cool <laughs> uh so to you youtube exclusive listeners what's up welcome back hey. yes we're still doing this if you're listening to this now we're probably on episode 200 uh wow so I'm just going to say that. It's gonna, I'm just going to call a shot. Probably. You should check, at least. You should probably check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Also, check us out on Twitter at Goosebuds Pod. Yeah. I, I actually have a small thing to promote. Oh, promote. Oh, please, Kevin, Promote away. Yes. Um, uh, so, very excitingly, we are moving to print with the Space Kings book. Oh, yeah. Woo-hoo! Which uh, means that Space Kings will be available for general purchase sometime in the near future. Uh, if you would like an email when that happens, you can sign up for one at spacekings.space, uh, and you can fill out a little form, and uh, I'll send you an email when the digital or the physical version of Space Kings is available. And if you're a newer listener or someone who's maybe missed a bunch of episodes and you don't know what Space Kings is, we did a bunch of Goosebumps RPG episodes on this podcast. You can go listen to it. It's an adapted use of the Space King system. You can find out how it works. You can listen to a little playthrough, and you can see how funny and uh, incredible of a time you can have with your friends by playing Space Kings. Uh, real also, go check right out now. Pretend Friends, the podcast that focuses on Space indeed, Kings. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. There's a whole other podcast if you would like that as well. Yeah. Space Kings is my uh, 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 is the tabletop system I developed with my friends that uses playing cards instead of dice. Um, it, it's very fun to play with a group of drunk and rowdy adults uh and it's uh it's coming out soon and it's been it's been a while in production so i'm officially telling everyone to get excited <laughs> that's super awesome and by the way if you're listening to this episode in the past or in the future when this is now the past if the books are available <laughs> at that time will that also be the same link yeah if if you visit spacekings.space in the future um it'll just direct you to a place where you can purchase the books not a not an email sign up thing but spacekings.space cool. is always going to be a relevant link for space kings information fuck yeah congratulations kevin Congrats, it's a genuinely kevin. amazing game i i rolled some uh new characters with some friends uh, a couple weeks ago oh fun uh, we got everything from a giant asteroid sized <laughs> robot uh <laughs> that i'm very excited to see how that plays out <laughs> <laughs> to a butler, to what I'm kind of assuming is a grim dark. What if Samus from Metroid was possessed by Venom? Uh, it's a really crazy Hell cast yeah. of characters. I'm excited to start playing some adventures with. That's what I love to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool system. Uh, well, guys, thanks for sharing this with me. I, I guess uh, I'll see you next time for Buy Squeezers Part Two: Colon Get Squeezed. Hey, squeeze you later. Squeeze you later. Take a squeezy. <laughs> bye bye. Squeeze upon them. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. This episode of Goosebuds is brought to you by our wonderful Patreon supporters, and now we shall read from the Book of Names. The first name, <laughs> Stefan Jive Turkey Kuabara. The second name, and we're definitely not going to count all of these, Hollis Hornbeek. The third name, and this is the last you'll hear of it, I swear, is Cameron Murphy Audio. <laughs> I'm bucking the trend, Michael McDowell. 
Hey, Josh Robb. Mickey C. Nathan Dolezal. Kelly C. Mike Lanteri. Buddy Morrill. Allocade. Mel Dipson. Low Belly Hate Me. Afshin. Danky McStanky. Dango Twist. Brian Wells. This Monday night. The nefarious tentacles will match up against the mysterious stranger <gasps> at the right of Rumble. Oh! Be there. Oh! Oh! I love it. Cool reference. That, that's a thing. That's a comic I did. I, lo- I love it. I clap. <laughs> <laughs> Stealth Bates. Patrick Reynolds. Jason Crooker. <laughs> Clay Castle. Miguel Pardo. John Keedy. Calf. Third Sergio. New episode of Paranoia Shop out now. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can't even just I can't even argue with Yoda voice. <laughs> Quentin, I am in your walls. Oh my. Gregory D. Warren. Alan Saylor. Cody Redfield. Bradford Coulter. Aiden Alexander Dice. R. E. Infected. Jar Jar Slinks. Justin Wagman. Chosen One. Levi Than. Up and Champ. Jonas Engman. Carl. Broccoli was here. Recipe still incoming. Just need to find a pretty bowl. <laughs> That's the, the thing that always stops me from cooking my recipes. Wow. The pretty bowl that I need, need for them. Yeah, I just, all my bowls are just like covered in mud. Yeah. <laughs> you guys need to get some prettier bowls, guys. <laughs> the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation is providing bowls for this show. Oh, Elusive Koala. Yanni Markovina. Alicia Graf. Joe. Brooke X. Jesus Christ. Christian Van Skeever. Drew Applegate. Jeremy Love. Brian Hobgood. Zach Connor. Patreon underscore donator, comma, yo. Joe Spooky Digital Ghost. Tierney. Tom Whittem. Andrew Jadzik just sold his script for Homework Strike to A24. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> damn it. He goddamn scooped us. <laughs> Lord Cornwallis. Carson Birkenbean. Murph E.P. Jonas Blotterman. Tevin Ticklebean, Gnome Ranger. Sean, uh, Kylie Minogue. I added the Kylie part. (laughs) Rushy Glenn. Wiggle it! Paul Grasso. Joe, regular name, Scott. Japansom. Matt McClellan. Alex Moon, the robotic dog. Sarah Kemp. Tanya Turtle. Vincent Modica. Luke Canoodles. Hugh Bolin. Zambambino. One Jalapeno. Keith Halcrow. Timothy Misodolakis. Clay McCarty. Matthew Stevens. Parker Lee. Nathan Remick. Need more kimchi. Ham underscore boat. Hey guys, Kevin here. Skip this if not cool. <laughs> Pretend friends. What's uh, what's going on? That's a fun name. We won't we won't say anymore. <laughs> 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 We're working on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Raymond Hernandez. <laughs> Flemily. The Crow Fens, but seasonal. Ooh, Matthew Sutton. Reed Steubendick. Lee Wood. Jeffrey Owen Cawhee. Joey Evans. Kelsey Kinneman. Carewise Gamgee. Russell Kastberg. Xavier Jimenez. Brandon Arafin. Liam Neeson's Doe. Chris Putricus. Scotty Pippen. Swaggy Yellow Squire. Cameron Hansen. Streak. Meet Virginia. Dungeon Kappa. Generally depressing. The Deadly Bulb. Boss Gerritsen. MC Hamster. Zach Weir. Limp Duck. Stinklitch. Alan G. Jessam. Yeah, yeah. Ben Bohan. Wow, that was a good bet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a good yeah. Thanks, man. Adam Muth. Elden Slink. <laughs> Terrifying. Hey, Anthony, I'm glad you're doing better. Keep up the good work. Mm-hmm. Ryan Stewart. Jonas and Avoldson. Calamity Carl. Nick Johnson. Estimena, Lord of Paul's Pants. <laughs> Stephen Day. The Davy Boy. Kenny M. Ryan Carroll. Jeremy Bowser. Kieran McNamara. Diet Soda. Megan McCormick Mason. Jackie Ledoux. Coleman Laguza. Lamb! <laughs> Ninja Breadman. <laughs> Got little old moi pretty Frenched. A pair of Scots. Peanutburg level 69. Levi Kidder. Dr. Chocula. David Gray. Jimmy Soul. Bryce Deary. Carb Sun. I am Cornholio. I need TP for my bunk. <laughs> Moon Juice. Some of Chad's bird friends. But not all of them. Nicholas Maloney. <laughs> Burgers theft bicycle. Now he'll never get his bed sheets back. I don't know if I completely understand that story, but I'm sorry about your bicycle. It's the reference back to camp to the last camp where we talked oh about my God. the bicycle thief. Yeah. Oh my. 
<laughs> it's a bicycle thief reference. Bicycle thief oh reference. God. Deep, deep, deep film cut. Burger, what are you doing to us? <laughs> the SSJ Trogdor. Midwest Indigo 13. Thomas Jansis. Aaron Lord. Eric Horowitz. Tiffany Lee. Dr. Eggdrop Soupman. Dunnage Warehouse. Lucretia. I'm saying, I'm sorry. Lucretia McEvil. Elm Realm. Mutant Astronaut. Henry Torbear. Mike Spaghetti. Jones. Adam Knapp. Logan Derby. Brad Schmelzer. Chick. Chris. Milk Punk. David Lynch. Triple X. Brandon Fraser. Six, six, six. Mr. Misfire. Mandy Nasty. Llama Lad. Skeletorin. Soggy Newspapers. Wagmar Wigner. Dakota Camp. John W. Philip Reynolds. Detroit Red. Nathan Gurney. 976 EVIL. RR Davis Crafts Reanimator. <laughs> That's Scott a- Wable. Kit Bush. Kiwi of Lerve. Serial Killer X. That's Dr. Mr. Unimportant to you. Doctors. <laughs> Uh, Josh Howe. <laughs> Allie Safe. Liam Rogers. I want to say that one more time. Allie Safe. Liam Rogers. Evan Bowen. Zach Bentley. Benjamin Luther. Dennis Wright. Jover the Moon. Greg Musto. Cameron Gonzaveld. Vosivi. Matt Scepter. Greg Urasi, a.k.a. Vitazen. Hi. Hi. Dakota hey, Kipper. Chad's Chard <laughs> Chunky Chode. What happened to <laughs> my, my chode? God, you're chode. Rip. Anthony Rodriguez. B. Hi. First time, long time. Allie Rose. Sprinkle Buns. Jeff Webb is a big baby, and now that it's been said on a podcast, <laughs> it is definitely true. I'm not attacking someone who doesn't listen to the podcast. Am I, Jeff Webb? <laughs> or Jeff Webb's quote-unquote friend. <laughs> Julius, the nice dragon, who would never, who would never call <laughs> who would it his friend. Who stupid. would never say anything wrong about Jeff Webb. Reverend Odin's eye hole, MB Esquire. Ooh, doctors. More doctors. <laughs> Turaku, the thing that goes doink in the anime. Hilda B, doctor lawyer. I made that part up about the doctor lawyer. <laughs> Spencer, why? <laughs> Oh, it's me. <laughs> it's you. James Stavrinos. Jonathan McAneesh. Gelato Coon. Ooh, fun. Jonathan Gonzalez. Kate the Great. Mike Hart. Chris Byers. And welcome, Papa underscore Snack. And welcome, Gulliver. You have become Great. trapped forever amongst us in the Book of Names. 